have to ask if we have new members attending tonight because I've been told we have. So uh, I think there are four of you, uh, if that's the case. Um, one at a time, would you uh, identify yourselves and say what town you're from and welcome to all of you in advance. Thank you, Thank you Randy. Good, we like those year-round people. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask for any details about that. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to all of you, and thank you, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as always, we like to thank our hosts, um, Rob and Betty Pelt, uh, the owners, and. Uh, Dave James, the general manager, Dave Jaden, the man that you uh, probably know the best when you're buying wood, which I hope you have tonight. Um, and um, uh, I will turn it over to Dave now. He's got a few uh, specials that he's going to talk about and uh, also a word or two about our uh, April meeting, which will uh, be um, uh, another meeting on epoxy and resin and so forth. You want the mic? How's everybody doing? So good to see you all again. Some specials we got going on is you might not have noticed yet, but we're actually carrying sandpaper for orbitals over by the epoxy resins. Um, today only we're doing 15% off. Um, I think we got the big square sheets, 50 per pack. I'm not sure how many uh, orbital pads come in the boxes. I haven't really looked at that yet. Um, 100, thank you. 100 pieces in the pack. Um, now, compared to Diablo, it's a little bit more expensive, but the pro side is that you get longer life out of it, and I've definitely experienced that with uh, my use out in the shop before I became a salesperson. Um, the only thing that gets better life than that cling sport paper, in my opinion, is going to be the, uh, the ceramics, and unlike the ceramics, if you pull a corner on these, it's not going to fall to bits, uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, Let's see, April meeting, the 17th, that's going to be lots of fun. We're going to be doing river tables, uh, talk about crack filling, good tapes, bad tapes, uh, the stuff that's not in the manuals that I found out firsthand, how I burned myself a few times, and how you guys can avoid doing that. Um, so that'll be fun. And we might do two river tables, I'm not sure yet. Um, we also got something pretty exciting brewing. I can't get too much into it, but I'm sure y'all will enjoy it. It has to do with epoxies. Um, and it's definitely going to benefit not only you guys, but us in the shop as well. Um, so if you want to figure out what's going on with that, uh, stop on by um, on the 17th, or you can watch the live stream on YouTube, Vantage Lumber YouTube, and you can watch it there. I got a lot of guys who want to be here, but they're heading back north, so they're going to stop on in YouTube and check it out. And if you can't watch it on the 17th on the live stream, it should. Chad, is that going to be saved on there? Is, it's going to be It'll stay on there? Yeah, it's going to stay on the YouTube even after the live stream. So if you just don't have a chance on the 17th to watch it, when you do get some free time, you can go watch it. Um, anyways, I'm going to hand it back over to Russ. Thank you all. Thank you, Dave. Um, that should be another good meeting uh, on uh, resin. Uh, many of us have been playing around with it. Uh, not all of it has been successful. <laughs> uh, so uh, we should be, be learning a lot more. Um, looking forward to that. Um, on, uh, as uh, most of you know, on April 13th, which is a Saturday, we will have a uh, pyrography workshop with Kimberly Glover. Um, we have, uh, I think, eight or nine, maybe ten signed up already. Um, we could probably accommodate 12, maybe 13. So if you're interested, um, uh, let Jim Weeks know. And um, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth about exactly what we need to provide and what Kimberly's going to provide. So we haven't gotten that fully ironed out. We will over the next week, and we'll let you know by email, and I'll mention it at the meeting next Tuesday as well. So she's going to be providing quite a lot of stuff. So don't be intimidated and think, oh, I don't have anything to bring in. Um, uh, er we can accommodate everybody. So hope to see many of you. Um, as you also know, uh, we've been working on um, redoing our bylaws. It sounds like a big deal, 
uh, we're really just updating a few things from the old bylaws, which were fine. Um, we're taking out a few clauses that are needed, adding one or two uh, that we thought were. And um, we should have the, uh, the dra first draft is done. Um, I'm in the process of rewriting the draft based on input from board members. I will send it out to the membership for their comments. And what our goal is, is to vote on it uh, at the April meeting. Um, but you will, if you've already headed back north or if you can't make that meeting, you, there will be a way for you to uh, vote by email. And we'll let, keep you posted on how that will I happen exactly. Ideally, we would um, ha have the email votes uh, ahead of the meeting vote, and then uh, if, uh, assuming that it's, uh, we get a favorable vote, then they would become uh, um, the new uh, bylaws as of that meeting. But uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, Norm, you have uh, something to announce for a um, uh, little work crew next um, Tuesday at Frank's. I won't let you down. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Norm. Yeah, don't be intimidated by um, thinking you have to know how to run a chainsaw. There's lots of work for everybody to do. We'll have a couple of saws going. And there's just a lot of uh, pushing stuff around. We'll have a fire going. Uh, Bill Clark can come and get pieces uh, for his next projects. Um, <laughs> we'll turn it into a party. <laughs> um, going forward with, um, with demos, we're, after we get into uh, April, uh, we've got kind of an open calendar. And I realize a lot of you will be heading back north. Uh, uh, I will be for a while myself. I'll be back midsummer, um, but we don't have a lot scheduled. So if you want to see something, have an idea, uh, any kind of a demo that you might have heard about, um, let us know. I mean, we we have feelers out all the time, and sometimes people can make it, and sometimes they can't. So um, we we love to have your input. We want to provide what what you're. Um, uh, looking for and we're hoping to see. So don't hesitate, uh, get a hold of me or Jim uh, or any board member uh, with some ideas uh, or any leads at all. Uh, that would be helpful. Um, I guess that's very my very short list of uh, um, uh, notes and announcements here. Does anybody have anything that they would like to say before we go into a, a show and tell, which without Frank, uh, do I have any volunteers to do show and tell tonight? I didn't think so. <laughs> All right, I'll, tr I'll try to wade through it. <laughs> uh, but anybody have anything else? To oh, um, Steve wanted me to mention, uh, uh, if you haven't paid your dues, um, please uh, do so, um, particularly if you're going back north. Um, we have maybe two-thirds of the members paid up, maybe slightly more. Be nice to... Uh, get everybody paid up uh, by the next meeting. So if you haven't, uh, get a hold of Steve and let him know. Tom, are you w working toward the front here? Oh, okay. Well, Tom's going to do a couple of his... Uh, he sold all the tickets for the uh, gouge, so we'll, we'll do that at the end of the, of the demo along with our regular um, raffle. So... Uh, with uh, out anything further, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and do uh, show and tell. I'll turn it over to Frank. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> um, could somebody help me so they can just hold up the piece while, so I can keep on talking? That would be a big help. Pick anyone you like. Okay, what do we have on the tag here? Laurel Oak. All right, I know where that came from because I helped. 
we have a lot of laurel oak back at Frank's, so don't be afraid of it. You can see what a beautiful piece it made. It has incredible grain. Don't confuse this with live oak, which w most of us would not even put in the burn pile. Uh, laurel oak is quite a different animal, and it does have that beautiful uh, variation between the, um, the heart and the sapwood. So uh, come by and um, help yourself to a couple pieces and see what you can do with it. Thank you, Norm. All right, Bill Dooley. Not hard to see that that's rosewood. Nice natural edge. What'd you put on it for a finish? You said oil. What kind of oil do you use, Bill? Tongue oil. Tongue oil? Uh, is it polymerized or do you uh, buy the raw oil and, and uh, add your own uh, thinner to it? Uh -huh. How many coats? You say it, it isn't polymerized. Well, uh, is it branded? Does it have a, a label? Oh, does it just say pure? I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I've tried different types types of tongue oil myself. Some work and some don't. And I found that if I put a little Japan dryer with it, uh, it will uh, harden off much quicker. You don't do that. You don't put any additive with it. Okay. And. Good, good uh, job with uh, keeping the bark on it. Um, did you use any CA glue to save what you could? Yeah. How old was the piece? Was it from this newest bunch? Yeah. Uh, and speaking of which, we do have a lot of uh, uh, rosewood blanks for your um, uh, for the food shelf bowls. I mentioned it last week, but um, come and come by Frank's and pick some up. And uh, feel free to take a few, and uh, if you're driving home back north, take them uh, to work on them over the summer. Did you have something to add, Norm? Well, there's another reason to come by and get a, a couple pieces. Uh, that's good, because that's a problem, particularly when, when in Florida, when um, in the north, when a tree is cut in the wintertime, the bark is tight. Uh, and that's, uh, you usually don't have that kind of a trouble. In the summer, when there's sap and just a lot more moisture in the tree, throughout the whole tree, that's when you have a problem. So uh, that's, that's good to know, Norm, because uh, in, in turning Florida wood, um, losing bark can be more of a problem because we don't have a, a, a dormant season. So thank you very much. We have Scott, uh, another rosewood piece, and it's finished with walnut oil. Scott, very good job on um, getting that uh, grain very balanced. And is that, you've got the pith? So you took a, you took a limb and uh, cut the piece and kept the pith in it. Scott, where are you? Yeah, um, yeah that's, uh, it's a great way to use small pieces of wood that would otherwise uh, end up going to Bill Clark to make it make something. <laughs> Sorry, Bill, <laughs> couldn't resist it. Um, and just walnut oil. Is it a uh, processed walnut oil or? Uh huh. So they sell it as a um, as a food safe finish. Yeah, good, good job. Uh, okay, Bill Clark, now he gets his uh, legitimate due here, Cocobolo, uh, and this is, uh, as many of you know, Cocobolo is so oily that um, uh, you really don't need to put a finish on it, you just keep buffing it, and, it, and that's what happens. Uh, is the outer ring also Cocobolo? No. What, what's that? Sycamore. sycamore. And is there a finish on the sycamore? Lacquer. Lacquer. Um, Boy, that's a beautiful job, Bill. The, uh, we're gonna, uh, as you'll see in a minute, we're gonna learn more about lidded uh, vessels tonight from uh, our, our guest uh, demonstrator, Jack Roberts. But that's, that's excellent. Beautiful wood. Bought right here at Advantage Lumber, I'm sure. You don't get that in the burn pile. <laughs> uh, another piece from uh, Bill. Piece of rosewood, and you put some lacquer on that one. 
how old was that piece when you started turning it? Was it from last year or was it from the fresh stuff we got a few, few weeks ago? Good. Did you let it sit for a while B before you finished it? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, no need. <laughs> Why waste time, right? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And another one, Purple Heart and Yellow Heart. One of my two favorite woods. I really don't like Purple Heart. It's, it's so chipped so easily. That, nice job. And the finish on that is like, <coughs> excuse me, I always lose my voice. Uh, lacquer also. Um, do you uh, use a CA as a uh, sealer or do you just use the lacquer all the way through from the base coat to the finish? Yeah. How many, how many coats? Good. Thank you. I'll <laughs> let you pick up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as many of you know, I've been, uh, I've been playing around with uh, epoxy and um, a lot of my efforts have not been too successful, but I am proud to say this is some uh, epoxy that I got here at Advantage Lumber two weeks ago, and this was my first piece uh, that I did with it, and I cast it separately. The, the epoxy part and the, um, and the yellow heart part are done separately, obviously. Um, the, I meant to bring the jig in, but I made a jig um, for my table saw, and I cut these grooves, and it's where the jig is horizontal, and I just feed it back and forth, back and forth. The indexing I did using a piece of graph paper that I got off the internet, uh, so you can get the layout very precisely by doing that. Uh, and then I just had pencil lines to, uh, to uh, go by. Then I flipped it over using the same jig that I had used on the table saw. I, I uh, had a recess already cut in it. It was a piece of MDF mounted it on the lathe like this. To hold it on the lathe, I took some little small pieces of plywood and some screws and just made little tabs to hold it down. I put about eight or 10 of them around the, the uh, circumference and it held it nicely. So that was good and rigid and then I could make these, these cuts. And the way I index those is uh, I use a, a beading tool um, and all, all I, these aren't turned round, they're too flat but the beading tool is used simply as a measuring device and that's the way I get the spacing so even on that. So, and then I cast the uh, centerpiece separately and um, you don't have to come and pick it up, you can probably smell the finish. I was spraying this at about 1.30 this afternoon. <laughs> so it's a little on the green side, but anyway, I had fun and I'm gonna have a couple more pieces uh, to show you uh, for our, um, at our, uh, April meeting when we talk about epoxy. So I hope I didn't miss anybody. Oh, yes. Dave, more rings. You, br uh, you brought some in last week and you've done some more. And these are, these are uh, epoxy discs that you buy and then you buy the uh, little ring blanks and you turn the epoxy uh, to the exact size of the of the ring disc, and then um, uh, you set those in with CA, or is it a, just a pressure fit? Uh huh. And then you, it all goes on a mandrel, and you do the final turning uh, after it's mounted on the um, uh, the little. They're stainless steel, I assume. Nice job. You know, do some more of those. Just curious, how long does it take you from start to finish? I know people ask me that all the time, and I ha I never ha have a clue. But <laughs> yeah. Good. And the uh, the buffing? How do you do? You just buff them? Yeah. And wh how high a grit? Just curious, because I went up to 12,000 grit with little micro mesh pads today. I, I, may, I think I need lessons from you. 
Uh, I really struggle to get the scratches out of mine. Eric. <laughs> wanna, uh, yeah, want to do a Tuesday demo on uh, how you make those? Yeah. <laughs> we'll make a few more. We have some openings, as I mentioned earlier. That, no, that would be nice. Thanks, Dave. Um, anybody else have anything before we uh, move to our uh, demo for this evening? Um, Jack Roberts comes to us from um, Jackson, uh, Jacksonville. How about Gainesville? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, with his uh, co-pilot, Stephanie, who is a potter, by the way. Uh, so they're both very much involved with each other's craft. Uh, um, uh, he's been doing it for over 10 years. Um, he regularly demos around North Florida and um, um, was happy to have the opportunity to come a little far, uh, farther south. Um, we met at the symposium and um, uh, got to talk to him a little bit and see some of his work. Um, he's really kind of made a, he does do bowls and other things, but his, he's made a, um, a specialty of doing uh, lidded boxes. Um, and um, his home club is the Bell uh, Wood Turners. Bell is actually 20 or so, 30 miles north, northeast of, uh, northwest. Um, so uh, he has to go out there, uh, everyone, I think they have 30 members or so. Um, one of, uh, this was a, a statistic I learned and I might have mentioned it. Florida has 29 wood turning clubs. I never would have guessed that. 17 of which are uh, AAW chapters. So there's lots of them scattered all around the state. And uh, Bell Wood Turners is one of them. So um, what we're working on, and I've talked to other club presidents around the state, and we're going to do this with the help of the uh, AAW home office setting up um, lists of regional turners and, and also contact people, usually the president or one officer in the club of all the area clubs, so we can better coordinate. So when we have somebody like Jack that uh, makes the effort to come all the way down, um, a three plus hour trip for him, uh, he can hopefully the next time he makes the trip, he'll be able to go on, stay overnight and go on and do a a demo for a Peace River or Fort Myers or another club that, so it makes it more worthwhile, it makes it more economical, economical for the clubs to do it. Um, so this is coming in the future and fortunately it's not all a local effort. The AAW home office is very aware of this to, to help um, all the regions uh, to um, just to promote their turners better and make, make uh, de more demonstrators possible for those clubs. So um, without any more talk on my part, I would like to introduce you, uh, Jack Roberts, and he's gonna do a, <coughs> a demo on uh, lidded boxes. Take it away, Jack. And I'll turn mine off when you get yours turned on. Green light. There we go. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Good evening. First of all, thank you for having me. I, I don't think I've ever turned at a venue this nice. In fact, as I know I haven't. This is this is pretty spectacular here. The only thing I, I was telling Russ, the only thing you guys are missing is a beer tab. We ain't even having it made. You know. Uh, let me start off and, and talk about demoing. Uh, the majority of the clubs are are really hunting for demonstrators and. Do we have any other demonstrators? Anybody out there demonstrate? I can see you. Raise your hand. Not a soul. Ah, one, one. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Uh, let me tell you about demonstrating. A lot of you guys would, are pretty good turners, and you don't want to demonstrate because you're going to get up here and make a mistake and mess something up. When I make a mistake and mess something up, I'm going to tell you about it, and I'm going to show you about it. And later, all my other guys at demo, we're going to get together, and we're going to laugh about it because we think it's funny. Because everybody gets catches, everybody makes mistakes. I've seen national turners make lidded boxes and the lids, you know, they didn't fit, the threads didn't fit. So if you ever wanted to get up here and show people what you can do and share your knowledge with other people, don't let the fear of making a mistake stop you from doing it. Like everybody else, I was scared to death the first time I got up here, but that was about eight years ago. And now I demo probably at least eight times a year and some years as much as 12 times. So don't let that stop you. Okay, next thing I want to talk about a little bit before I get started is safety. I'm going to tell you 
you, you guys and ladies, you know what safe is. Safe is kind of a personal thing. Uh, all of you are going to go back to your own shop and you're going to do what you think is safe. Uh, and that's fine with me. Just remember, if you get injured, it looks bad on everybody. So you might want to use some common sense. You want to you do things that are going to protect your face and your eyes. I'm going to start off wearing a mask because when I start off rounding this piece of wood up, it's going to throw a lot of chips. Then I'm going to take, take the face, face shield off because you can't hear me very well with it on. Normally at home, I generally wear it. Uh, respirators, if, you, if, you, if you're handling dusty situations, this is a nice little lightweight, cool respirator. It's sold by a lady named Paula Nix. She was one of the founders of the Fort Myers Club. She now lives in my area. It sells for, I think, about $39. It lasts forever. You can machine wash it, you cannot dry it. She said her mistake was she made them where they last forever. If you ever tear it up, she'll replace it. If you're gonna, I use a lot of chemicals. I do a lot of, uh, if any of you went and saw my stuff at the Florida Symposium, you saw a lot of uh, dyes and, uh, and paints and stuff. If I'm gonna use chemicals, I wear a mask that's designed, it has activated charcoal. It's designed so that you're not breathing that stuff. Now, all that being said, some of the things I'm gonna do up here tonight are not the safest things in the world because I have a time constraint. I'm working on a machine I'm not familiar with and I actually had to change some of the tools I'm going to use. So it might be an exciting evening. Uh, <laughs> Lee, Lee Sky and I were standing around talking one night and we decided, you know, demonstrating is kind of like being a NASCAR driver. Some people came to root you on, some people came to see somebody else win and a lot of guys just came to see a good crash and burn. So <laughs> there you go. All right, if you have questions, please yell them out. I'm, I'm at the age where sometimes I don't hear real well. I'm not embarrassed to be yelled at. Uh, I want to cover everything I can. What's, what's my percentage of beginning turners? If you feel like you're a beginning turner, give me an idea so I know what I need to teach to. Four guys, that's it. The rest of you guys are veterans, right? Okay. We're, we're going to turn some boxes. I use three different techniques when I turn boxes. I'm going to teach you the most versatile, the one that you can actually do anything from. The variations that I use from this are only because they have some advantages on some of the boxes I want to make. The, the technique that I'm going to show you, and we're going to do some embellishments and some other things, which really, if, if, you, if you haven't ever made any boxes before or you, or you want to get better at your boxes, just concentrate on the, on the way I'm going to do it because it's going to cut down on some steps. It's going to make it simple for you. And forget about all the fancy stuff I'm going to do up here to fill up and make you go, ooh, look at that. Uh, so. The, the technique I'm going to show you will cover any of these boxes, even this little thing. This is a box. Okay? It's made with the same technique I'm going to, I'm going to show you. The only difference in this box is this is the top and this is the bottom, or this is the top and this is the bottom, because I, I parted it in the middle. That's the only thing instead of parting it on the end. Okay? This is a box that has no, that has no foot on it. My grandson likes it. He likes to play with it. Uh, and all these boxes, are, and the, here's some boxes that have some acrylics put in them, you know, and they're sectioned together. It would kind of be the segmented way to make a segmented box, but it's not truly a segmented piece. And I'll talk about all that as I go along. These are the boxes that I do demos with. This is a simple little box that I do a demonstration on. It's, uh, I'm going to use a piece of hard maple. The reason I'm using it is because it doesn't have much character. It lets me dye it and... Uh, and put some texture on it, it holds the texture really well, and it's really predictable. I don't get up here and have things moving around on me where the lid fits one minute and the lid doesn't fit the next minute. And I'll tell you about that. I'm gonna pass all three of these boxes around. Where do I start? Can I start with you? Just take them and pass them around. Everybody can take a look at them. See how the lids fit. You can take them apart. They don't bounce well on the floor if you drop them. So, questions? Can we get started? I got a piece of hard maple. It's a, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a piece of hard maple. It's, it's actually a uh, baseball bat material that they didn't make baseball bats out of because it wasn't straight enough grain. So it's roughly three inches by three inches and I cut it just a little over four inches long. That gives me enough to make a tendon on each end and uh, go from there. Now, I'm gonna pass this around in a minute and I'm gonna come back to it. So what we're gonna do up here is we're starting off with a round piece we're gonna make a tendon on what we hope is gonna be the top first. That way when we spin it around and put it in the chuck, we're gonna make a tendon on the bottom 
And when we part it off, we don't have to be moving pieces around. This piece will be in the chuck, this piece will be in the chuck, it'll be done. We won't have to do that third chuck or maybe that fourth chuck. So we're gonna put a tenon on this end, it's gonna to come to this other end, we're gonna put a tenon on the other end, we're gonna part it off. That's where we're gonna start. Now, let's see if I can get this thing to, we're gonna start off with a, with a spindle roughing gouge. One of the simplest tools to use. You notice I said it's a spindle ruffle gouge. You guys don't use this on end grain. Don't use it, if you're turning a bowl and the grain's coming this way, this tool is not designed for that. You take a high possibility of it breaking. So let me get this thing rounded up a little bit and uh, then I'll come back to you. At this point in time, if I were going to make a box of a design like this, where I had grain and I had spalting, which we're not doing, but I want to explain how to do it, I would be looking at this piece right now to see which side was going to be my top and which side was going to be my bottom. If I had some spalting lines down here, I don't know what you can get on a camera, if I had some spalting lines down here that were straight like this, running down it, and I had some that were say, were crooked like this, I would be looking to part this thing off in a spot that was where most of the lines were straight so that when you finished your box up, you'd have a continuous line down it. So I'd also be looking at this end for the same thing. So if this end had a bunch of straight lines and this end had a bunch of crooked lines, when I part those, those crooked lines off and I take a chunk out of it, and I'll come back to that in a minute, those lines are not gonna line up. So I would be looking to make this end my, my top. In this case, so what I would actually do right now would be flip it around. Before I went any further, I'd put my top end on this end when I made that determination. Everybody understand what I'm, what I'm saying? You wanna be able to part it where the lines are the straightest you can get them because that's gonna give you the best line, the grain alignment when you're finished. Me and this uh, one way are gonna, I've never turned on a one way before, so. Well, look, do I have any crackers in here? Anybody, anybody born and raised in Florida? I, I've got one, two. I'm just, I'm just wondering, you, you're probably wondering where the accent comes from. It's not from Boston, not to offend anybody from Boston. Okay, so I've got this thing roughed in a little bit. I'm gonna put a tenon on the end of it. You won't have to crank too hard on the I see that. Like you won't get it loose in there. I need to I need to loosen up. I'm used to my thirty five twenty. Okay, we're gonna square this end of it off and uh, we don't have it round yet, but it doesn't matter because if I round it up perfect now, when I flip it around, guess what? It's not going to be round again. So, we've got a dovetail chuck up here. I normally use a Vic mark. This is a chuck I'm not familiar with. So I took a minute and I measured the, uh, the jaw 
the jaws on it. To get this right, to get it close, is not going to work. So let me talk about tenons real quick. I, everybody that turns has kind of a thing that they're, is kind of their pet peeve. Mine is a good tenon. Uh, if you don't have a good tenon on this, the best you can hope for is that everything will come out good. The worst you can hope for is that the piece is going to come loose and hit you. It, you're going to get a little catch and it's going to knock and wobble and you're not going to get it centered up again. So in order to have a good tenon, you've got to get the thing diameter, the right diameter so that it fits and you've got to have the right angles. Now, let me explain that. I'm going to pass this around. You guys can take them, they're numbered, take a look at it. It's kind of dark back there. Make a decision on which you think is the best tenon. Later I'll take a vote and we'll see how, see how well you did. So here's what, here's what happens on tenons, okay? If I have a tenon and I make it too big and I have the jaws come in and the jaws are doing that and they're doing this, That was my wife, by the way. Just knew I bought those markers. <laughs> hey, everybody, everybody needs a little help, right? Okay, so I, I got my tenon like this, okay? If my jaws come in here and they're doing this, the reason they're doing that is because these jaws were started out that way, they machined them this way, and they cut them. So with a, with a kerf right here, if you put a, say, a, a 16th of an inch kerf in a set of chuck jaws, I don't care who makes them, they're all made the same way, you're going to find that that's a perfect circle. The most contact you get on here is where it's going to fit the best in the round. So what you ultimately want is you want a, a tenon like this, and you want a chuck that fits like this with just a very small gap in, the, in it right here. Now, I don't know how close I'll come up here on a chuck I'm not familiar with, but that's basically what you're looking for. Now, if you're using a dovetail chuck, you're looking for one other thing. Here's your, here's your piece of stock. Here's your dovetail. Okay? When your chuck comes in and your jaw comes in, you want your jaw to come in just like that, and it needs to touch as much as it can right there, and it needs to touch as much as it can right there, with one exception. And I'll tell you about it, and I'll tell you how I discovered it. I discovered it the hard way after I fought this thing for about a year. If you're turning in grain, which we're turning, okay, and we're putting a, a tenon on the end, and we put this chuck in here, and we tighten down on it right there, right there, it's going to pull the fibers together. What's going to happen is if I tighten it too tight, is it's going to split that right there. You're not going to be able to see it with your eye. But it's going to pull them, just like soda straws, it's going to pull them away from the rest of the wood, and you're going to have a microscopic crack right there. And then when you go to finish this thing out, and you get it all turned the way you want, and you sand it, and you see that circle, and you go, where did that come from? That must have been the jaw. So you sand on it some more, and you sand on it some more, and it doesn't go away, and it doesn't go away, and it doesn't go away. So then you say, the heck with this, and you grab a gouge and you run down it and you take another eighth of an inch off and you stand on it some more, and it's still there. So what you want to do is you want to relieve that little spot right there. I'm going to show you how to do that. And it, it won't do that to you. I found that out the hard way after I sanded a lot of boxes. All right, so let's finish this. I got this marked. We'll see, how, we'll see if I can live up to my conversation now. Here's the tool. Let's see if we can get that. Can you get that on the camera and come in on that? Mr. Cameraman. These angles right here fit my Vic Mark chuck. I don't know how they do on this chuck I'm fixing to use, but they're the correct angles that are going to give me 
this angle right here for that chuck to fit properly. This is made out of a this is made out of a uh, quarter inch parting tool. It's a tool I made. Now all I'm going to do. I'm just going to take a spindle gouge and I'm going to take a little bit out of this corner right here. And that's all there is to it. Now, if I did it right, we've got a tendon that's going to fit properly. It's going to hold really well. We're not going to crush the fibers and have a problem. And if I didn't do it right, it's just embarrassing, which is okay, too. I've been embarrassed before. Knockout rod. Knockout rod? I'm sorry? Over here? Anybody know what drawer? Little help. Would somebody find that for me while I, while I talk about something else? No, we won't. <laughs> that's, that's the first gouge I ever bought and actually paid money for. We're not going to knock it out with that. I'd yeah, I don't think so. No, it's not long enough. Keep, keep hunting. Okay, while he's hunting for that, let's talk about, talk about something else. When I get this turned around on this box, we we'll talk about grain alignment. We're going to lose, when we part this thing off and we put a tenon on it, I'm going to lose an average of three-eighths of an inch right here. So when I choose that spot, I want to choose... Like I said, the spot where the grain is the straightest. Now, I realize you guys don't have a lot of light, but I'll pass this around. And you're not going to have enough light to see this. I'm sorry for that. But right here, if you'll look at the bottom of this, if, you've got your, if you want to pull your phone out or something, you'll see how that, those fibers tore on this tenon, just like I explained earlier. So this is what we're, we want our box to look like when we're done. Nice, clean. I like a little curve in the corner for a couple reasons. It means if you put something in it, you can reach down and probably not the first time I got it. You can reach down in it, you can slide up something back out of it, and that's a whole lot easier to sand than a square corner. So if you go for the fancy square corner, you're fighting a lot of things to, to sand it. So we'll start that around. You can take a look at it. Technical difficulties. So. <laughs> it's not in there hard. The dial rod probably not there. Yeah, yeah, I caught the edge of it. Success. You know, I meant to look for this earlier and totally forgot it. Thank you. So, for your help. No, I'm done with that. I shouldn't need it again. While I'm doing this, if you were, uh, if you're wondering about my accent, uh, this is a west north north west coast Florida accent. My family's from kind of the swamps of Florida. Going back a number of generations, I now have, for my grandchildren, I have six, six generations of Floridians. So, I was in, uh, I was in Boston a number of years ago, and it's been quite a number of years ago now. And, uh, 
had to give a I had to give a speech. I was in a class, and after about the third day, everybody had to get up and give a talk. And I got up in front of about two hundred people, and I gave this talk. And the instructor told me afterwards, said, "Man, this, you did a great job. You got a great speaking voice. Where is that? Uh, where are you from?" And I said, "Florida." And he says, "Okay, but where's the accent from?" And I said, "Florida." And he said, "No, really, where's it from?" And I said, "Florida." And he said, and this was in Boston, and he says. He says, uh, no, man, I've been to Florida many, many, many times. Nobody sounds like that. I said, because you're not talking to anybody from Florida in Florida. <laughs> you know, everybody you're talking to came from somewhere else. They're not from Florida. But all right. So we're going to start off slow. We'll bring our speed up just a little bit. We got a little wobble. See it? I'm going to stop and show you a little secret. If I, if I pull this, t this live center back into this piece with it wobbling, it's going to try and pull it back straight. It's going to go in this little hole and try and pull it back straight. And then I'm going to end up in the end when I try and take this thing apart. I'm still going to have a wobble. So if you'll take this piece out, and I'm not going at home, I just, uh, I just hit it on my, lightly on my blade. If you take that piece out, you won't have that problem. It won't index back on you. You'll be in good shape. Now this, this now, will center anywhere, so I can start it up, come up to a little speed, pull it in there, let that wobble, but everything's running true. So it makes life a little bit easier. All right, now we're gonna make it round. For you guys that are beginners, if you see what I'm doing, I'm using, I'm using what, when I teach, I'm using what we call the ABC. I'm anchoring this tool on this tool rest. I'm finding the bevel that it's riding on, which is right here. You see, that's not cutting. And then I'm raising it up. So I'm, I'm the A is anchoring it, B is bevel, C is I'm raising the handle till I start my cut. Now that's an easy cut, you see there? You can do that cut one-handed, and it's not because I'm trying to be fancy. That's how controllable that is. It's easy. If, so if you're if you're a beginner and you're getting white knuckles, you're fighting the way this thing's designed. We only remove wood from a wooden piece one of three ways. I just told you one. We cut it off. Somebody want to tell me another one? We scrape it off. Who knows the third one? We rip it off. We we don't do one of those two first ones correctly. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm anchoring this tool, I'm finding my bevel, I'm raising it up. I've got, the, I've got the tool back here where it's supported in my body so that it's not doing this up and down and catching things so that when I find that bevel, I can stay on it and run right down it. And that's pretty round. I'm gonna round it up a little bit better because this grain's running really crooked on this, so it's, it's chipping a little bit, so. Uh, bowl gouge, 5 8 bowl gouge is my favorite tool. I don't know of any other single tool that you can make as many cuts. I could spend all night, I could, I could spend a whole hour and tell you how to make all different kinds of cuts with this, but we're just gonna get this a little bit truer here. So we're getting, we're getting these little fine shavings. So now we've got, we've got our blank round. We've got a tendon on our top end. We need to put a tendon on the bottom end so that when we part it off, we have a way to grab that. I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did before. So 
there. I see the most my calories. Well, I'm going to guess at it because I don't see my calories here. I think that's way too big. It's not bad. If you guys have any questions, just yell them. I'm turning it 1,753 right now. I have no idea. <laughs> I, could, I can turn. I turn where I feel comfortable, and that's where everybody should turn, where you feel comfortable. Now, if you're Jimmy Clues, you're going to turn at 3,600. I'm not comfortable at 3,600. I don't even turn pins at 3,600. So, but he loves to turn fast. And I love to watch him. He's a he's a character. Uh, probably, if if I don't even have my chuck out here. If I had my chuck, this this tool that I was showing you about, that length right there, from that point to right there, is the maximum depth of my tenon, of my chuck. So if I turn a tenon that's all the way to right there, I've maxed it out, it's almost touching in the bottom. So I know I've just got to stop somewhere in here. Now if I'm using my Big Mark 120 chucks, I normally turn with a 100. It comes on out to here, I can turn it, turn a full piece there and grab it. And if, you know, if I'm using a Big Mark 150 chuck, you can turn a tenon, you know, three quarters inch long. It's really deep. So, and the, the strength of your tenon is in two things. It's using the proper size tenon for the piece you're turning. I was watching a YouTube video. My wife was watching it with me one day, and a guy had like a 35-pound piece of hand. He put a tenon on her about that big, and I turned it off. I said, I'm not even watching this, you know, because that was insane. I would have had at least five inches on it. All right, at this point in time, what I would do is I would decide where I'm going to part it. And in this case, it doesn't matter because it has no grain. So I can part it anywhere, but I would be looking for grain alignment. I would be looking for that straight grain up here. When I part, I like to turn my lathe down a little bit. If you notice, I keep turning this rheostat down. I don't ever use the off on at home. I know when I turn my lathe on, it's just, it's all the way off. If I don't, because if I turn it off here and I accidentally turn that up and then I turn it on, I don't know what speed it's going to start off. So I'm used to turning off on a rheostat. So we're having a little bit of a learning curve here. But that's okay. So I'm gonna drop down here, and it doesn't matter where I where I part it. I'm gonna right there. Looks like a good spot. I've got an eighth inch parting tool. It's a homemade parting tool. I'm making a cut, and then I'm coming back and making about a half a cut. So I'm actually making something that's bigger than an eighth of an inch, so that this tool doesn't get in here and bind. If it gets in here and it starts getting some resin on it and starts to bind up, it'll break. And this is made out of a planer blade. It's another homemade tool. And I broke two of them over the years. And this is the last one, so I'm really going to baby it. I don't want to break it because I haven't been able to find another planer blade like this. On a box, you, you feel free to open this thing up once you get in there. The only thing that you're worried about is you don't want to take a lot of the outer material off because that's where your box goes together. In the center, you're going to hollow it all out anyway, so it doesn't matter whether or not you take it off. Whoa, didn't want to do that. There's your first catch because I got busy talking and not paying attention. 
we'll see how bad it is here. Yeah, we'll take it out. All right, there's our lid. We're going to hollow this. We're going to true it up. Right across here. We don't need to get about that much of it square. See, this is one of those things where you get in a hurry. You normally should turn your lathe off, but all you guys the ladies know that, right? Now you can hollow this with anything you want. It doesn't matter. I'm just using a tool that's in my hand. first really critical thing we come to is making this mortise. The mortise is the female part of where the box goes together, okay? It doesn't matter whether you put the mortise in the top or the bottom. I like to put it in the top because the top's where I started and I found that it's easier for me to make a tenon to fit the mortise than it is to make a mortise to fit the tenon. But I've done them both ways. So, you know, what I'm showing you is how I make a box. Guys, there's a lot of ways to make boxes. So don't think that if you do them different, that, that it's wrong. It's however you do them, if it works for you, keep doing them that way. The critical part here is the lip where it slides in. It has to be perfectly parallel. If it's not perfectly parallel, your lid's not gonna fit properly. It's either gonna be really sloppy or it's gonna be tight going on and then it's sloppy but it's never gonna fit properly. It's gonna be one of those lids that you turn it upside down. Now, if, if you had that box, if you took one of those boxes and you turned it upside down, that lid will slowly float off there, but it doesn't just fall off. That's another reason why I like to use a, a, a uh, piece of hard maple. It's because it's really, really dependable to, to do that in a demo. At home, I turn lid boxes out of anything, and if they work, they work, and if they don't, my wife and I had a big bonfire Saturday night, and we burnt some of that stuff. This is a Cindy Droza tool. I'm not trying to sell a Cindy Droz to tool, uh, but what I like is that it's square. At home, I have another scraper that I've made from another uh, quarter inch turning gouge. And look guys, if you go to these, these meet and greets, you can buy a quarter inch parting tool for 10 bucks and you can make a lot of tools out of it. All you gotta do is just think about how you wanna regrind it. So you can do that, you see that? You can come right straight across here and put it put a double, and this is double, it's sharp on the side, and it's sharp on the top. So that if I keep this tool parallel to my bedways, I'm gonna have a straight side to the top of this box. Everybody follow me? Did I lose anybody? Would you tell me if I did? All right, I got this tool at about center. I'm gonna go in, and I'm going, I've got, I'm looking right straight down at it, and I'm looking at the bedways, and these bedways right here, this bedway right here is telling me when this tool is straight, okay? Now, that's done. And if I did it correctly, it's straight. The way you tell if you did it correctly is you put a pair of dividers in here and you look at them. Is there square on the end? And you see if you really got it. It's pretty good. For a first shot, I'll take it. Because I'll mess it up somewhere else. And we'll be back to even. Now, now I can finish off my inside here. Somebody tell me how I'm doing on time. Okay. You say you're good, but you don't know how long I'm gonna be. So how long have I been up here? Ten to eight, thank you. 
That tells me what I need to know. I'm going to smooth this out nice and, nice and clean. Steady, even current. I got one more wire in here I want to try and get out. That's pretty good. Okay, that's the inside of my box. I like to give, uh, give everybody a little something to look at in a box, so I'm going to put a little design in the inside of it. It's super simple. You guys can pass these around. They're all pretty much the same, so you can just kind of scatter them around, take a look at a couple of them. You don't need to look at all of them. This is a, this is a Robert Soresby texturing tool. It's a smaller tool. I think it's like 80 bucks without a handle or something. Uh, this, this handle actually came off something else I had on. I had a wooden handle on it. It's got a plate for setting on it. It, it does different things whether you're turning in grain or side grain. It does different things depending on how you have the angle here. It does different things on how you present it to the wood. Now, let me explain that to you. We want it to start in the center here. If I start this tool in the center, it's going to make a little tight spiral. So here's, my, here's the, the inside of my, of my lid. It's going to start off make, by making a little spiral like this. Now the problem is, is these teeth are a certain distance apart. That doesn't change at all. What does change is if I'm at this diameter right here, and I go to this diameter right here, and I got 10 teeth touching there, I'm not going to have 10 teeth touching out here. I'm going to have a whole lot more teeth touching out there because the distance can't change on these. So what I need to do is I need to be able to manipulate the tool so that as these come out, they spread out apart like this, and I have more distance there. The way I do that is by leading the handle on this tool. And this, this is one of these tools where I can tell you how to do it, but if you want to try it, you just need to take it and try it and see. I'm going to present this tool perfectly square in this top and get, this, get it tracking. Okay, I'm going to run this lathe. I don't have a, I don't have a RPM on it, but I'm going to run it, I hope, about 500 RPMs. I'm going to guess that's close. I'm going to start it tracking, and as it tracks, as it tracks, I'm going to lead the handle further forward than I lead the tip. So what it's going to do is, is let's see, where's the camera? I'm, I'm hunting your camera here. Here we go. So you see the angle that's here. As I track it, if you see that angle is like this, I track it forward, that angle turns like this. It turns flat. So that allows it to turn at, a, at a, a different ratio. So it's kind of hard to explain, but let me get it started and you'll see what I'm talking about. I get it started. I get it started. Nice and easy. It doesn't take a lot of pressure, but it takes firm, constant pressure. And I'm going to lead my, my hand faster than I'm letting the tip of the tool touch the wood. Now you see the angle I'm at here now? Where I started here, from here? Can you get that? You see what it did? It spiraled. And it didn't split the, it didn't split the spiral. So now I have a nice, nice little inside to a tool. Makes something interesting when somebody opens the box.
little sanding sealer, lacquer sanding sealer. I use predominantly in my sanding sealers, I use all lacquer sanding sealers. In my finishes, I use lacquer and I use automotive urethane. So if you guys saw any of my stuff at, at the Florida Wood Turning Symposium, it was probably automotive urethane. It's, uh, it's kind of difficult to use, but it gives you a great finish. It's a lot faster than lacquer and it never goes away. All right, I'm now finished with that. Let me think of what I did with my chuck key. I have the same problem at home, by the way, losing tools. Nobody else does that, do you? Okay, all right. So, can you give me a picture of that? Can you show me? There, there's the inside, and it's done. It's squared off, it's finished. I put that finish on there now, because I can't go back to that piece again. There's no point after this, there's no place where I'll actually be able to put a finish in that. And I would have sanded it if it needed it, but it, it, it really wasn't, it didn't. Okay, so now we'll go over to this piece. See if we made the tendon right. I made it a little bit bigger because I was afraid if I made it too small, I was in trouble. If I made it too big, I could make it work. Remember that piece I took out right there? It's not going to matter, you know why? Because that's going to be a tendon down there, so it's going to be a lot shorter, so I'm going to cut through it anyway. Not that I intended to do it, because I didn't. So it was an accident. It wasn't a true crash, good track, crash and burn, though, so stand by if we do get one of those. I never realized how hot these lights are. These are incredible. I guess, that ain't me. I'm not sure that this chuck runs absolutely true. Anybody want to vouch for Frank's chuck running true? Th this, you never touch the base of the chuck. It always has to sit on the flat of the, of the uh, jaw and the gripping part of the jaw. You never want this to reach all the way to the back. If you do, you're never gonna run true. And in the case, of, in, a, in a chuck, if I had my chuck, you'd see a big black mark on my chuck where I took a magic marker and marked it for the number one jaws because I hate to be down here trying to find the number one jaw. If I unchuck something, I'm gonna mark it because most chucks don't run absolutely true. We'd like to think they do, but they don't. So we're going to clean this up a little bit, and we're going to we're going to put a tenon on it. And I'm not going to worry about the wobble because I'm going to get it out later. Okay. Now there's a couple ways we can do this. One way is we can always measure it. The way we would measure it we would take our caliber, come right here, just like we did earlier to check if it was square. Come right here. Take a look at it. I think we should get about right there. So that's one way to do it. I don't generally do it that way because I find that it's time consuming and I can eyeball it.
I believe I just discovered the next tool I forgot to bring, which was my uh, wire brush. So we won't be wire brushing this. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of detail work here to make it look a little bit better. I'm gonna put a little part line right here. This works, you get a cleaner line here if you actually start this with a skew. But I'll warn you, these little lines going this way like to catch that skew and go zip. Really, really, and it's really quick when it goes zip too. So when, I suggest you just use a parting tool and maybe even start with a smaller parting tool than this. We're just gonna give it a little relief right here. See what it looks like. I wanted to get that torn grain out. I wanted to give it a little better texture. Now, I was doing this as a demo. I, I have to talk about this. I was doing this as a demo, and I always thought the best tool to use was probably the tool in your hand if you didn't have to go hunt one. And I happen to have a spindle gouge in my hand right now, and I went to go for this little corner right here like this. Like that right there. And that spindle gouge took a chunk out. It's called a catch. And it surprised me so much that it did it. I went, oh, and stuck it right back in there and then took a big chunk out. <laughs> in front of about 50 people, I said, well, that, you don't really want to do that. You know? It's, I put the seam in the middle. I, right, yeah, it doesn't matter where you put it. I put it in the middle. to get grabby with this tool. I'm just trying to give these lines a little bit of a definition here. there. And I was telling y'all the live stream this tonight, so if I get a really bad catch, I'll try and be real careful that I don't say ugly things about it. All right. A little wire. And we're almost done with the outside. Uh, because when you use this texturing tool, it fuzzes everything up. So I don't have it, so we're gonna unfuzz it with a piece of Scotch-Brite here. A wire brush, I have a little you know, Harbor Freight stainless steel brush, three for four dollars or something, you know, you get a nylon one, a stainless steel one, and a, and a uh, brass one all together. Okay. 
All right. This tile's been through a few demos. But nobody wants their lathe uh, painted. And I can't say that I blame them. So I was doing a I was doing a demo for HOW a few years ago and they had just got a brand new shield. It was when AEW came out and they wanted these wanted everybody to use a shield. And I like their shield by the way. And so they had a brand new shield. And they were so proud of it, and I was doing some demo, and I put a line of lacquer right up the middle of it, and it slung off there, and I went, whoops. All right. This is a, this is a product from Chromacraft. I don't know for a fact, but I think they're the only company that's actually selling spray dye. It's a really cool product. Uh, I'm going to show you how easy it is to use. We're going to dye this thing. We're going to Chroma Craft, right there. Chroma Craft. Chroma. C H R O M A C R A F T. Chroma Craft. They're out of Georgia. They were at the Florida Wood Turning Symposium. A uh, bunch of nice people. Really nice people on it. So this is for the this is for the people that don't have an airbrush. Obviously, it's not nearly as controllable as an airbrush, but it's a lot easier to use, especially in a demo. Y'all notice that I, I did put a, I did put a uh, cover over Frank's chuck here. All right. Let's see now if we can get it apart. I know it's not going to come apart easy. There it is. That wasn't too bad. We'll come back later. We'll put a little finish on that. Now we have to do is hollow it. There's a lot of ways to hollow these guys. I, uh, if I'm doing production boxes where I'm making like 10 for an art sale or something. I use a, I start off with a Forstner bit because I've got them all on separate blocks of wood. They're not chucked up and so I can drill like 10 of them at a time. Just drill them and throw them to the side and drill them and then come back later. And I'm looking for a Forstner bit that I have up here somewhere so that you can see it. Here it is. This is, this is a Forstner bit that I made. I bought a number two Morse taper with a 3 8 inch hole in it. You can buy it from several different online places. I put a, since you can't get a Forstner bit on a taper, you can get a regular drill bit on a Morse taper, but you can't get a Forstner bit on a Morse taper. If you can, I didn't find it. So I made my own. I put it in here. I lined it all up. I took my little welder and I welded it a couple of times. It's good to get started. You don't want to drill the whole box with it. You want to drill about three quarters of the box with it. It's small. It's not the full size. You're going to have to come back and redo the sides and do the bottom. You guys can pass it around. It's sharp, so be careful. Don't, don't hit the wrong spot of it. That's a, that's a time saver. Another time saver that I do is I don't, I don't hollow generally by hand. This is a, uh, a hollowing system by Trent Bosch. It all sits right there. That's how easy this is. This is why I love this system. That's how easy it is. And this collar right here is set for the height of my lathe. So when I walk up to my lathe and I do this, I'm ready to go. Just that fast. I put it up here like this. I drop it right there. I don't even put a handle on it for boxes. And I start hollowing. Now, unfortunately, you see it's way too high, so I'm not going to be able to use it here. But that's another alternative to hollow. This is the, the more, the, the, uh, Forstner bit and a hollowing system is the fastest way. The way that's probably going to be more su most successful for most of you guys is going to be a carbide cutter. 
they become popular. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of carbide cutters. Uh, I guess in that regard, I'm kind of old school, but I do have some. This is an easy wood tool. It, it's on the center. It's the cutter. Before I had that, and I actually got that in a state sale where I bought a whole shop out, I used, uh, I used this. This tool here, and I'll probably use it to finish with, is a design that uh, Jimmy Clues came out with. It, it, he called it his box scraper. The design here is just a little bit more than 90 degrees so that you can get the round in the corners without having a whole lot of the scraper touch at one time. If you've ever stuck a scraper in and you got too much of the scraper in the wood, you know why. The wood will take the scraper away from you. So I'll probably get around to that one. We're going to start that with this one. Somebody tell me what time it is, please. Okay, we're in good shape now. So we're going to hollow this a little bit. turn this way a little bit because I'm being pretty aggressive because nobody wants to watch somebody stand up here and holler for 15 minutes. I don't think. I wouldn't. So if we get some without naming any names I did a box demo about a year and a half ago for another club, and I left them the box. And I hadn't hollered it very far because I was running out of time. And this is a place where you can catch up on time pretty quick if you're not hollering it very well. And I ran into the individual that won it in the auction at a, at a big function. And he said, I've got your box, and you didn't sign it. And he handed me this box. He was so proud of this box. And he handed me this box, and I took the lid off of it, and I was embarrassed. I said, I'll never leave a box half hollered again, because somebody's going to be really proud of that box, and they're going to see my name on it, and that's not going to work. So you guys are just going to have to bear with me. I'm going to holler this box. That way, if you get it and you don't want it, it'll still be hollered. Now, depth gauge, we know this is going to be the bottom, we're going to leave about a quarter inch, so about where that black line is, right about there, I got another almost half inch to come out of it. One of the things you want to do when you're doing this is you want to make the beginning part of this, this sidewall square, because I'm going to have to turn this piece around and I'm going to have to jam chuck it back onto this piece of wood to turn this tenon off the bottom. Okay, or actually to smooth it up, I'm going to part it off. So if I don't get it nice and square right here, it's not going to jam chuck back again for me. So I need to make sure that the beginning part of it, at least the first quarter of an inch, is nice and square. So I'm going to do that now. about a minute and I'll be done.
plot is, we're, we're hollow to about right there, so it's got a little bit of a thick bottom there. But it's down low enough where I'm not embarrassed, so we'll let that go. Now, now comes the tricky part. Remember how top, tight our lid was before? That I threw over here somewhere? Okay. Help me out here. I know it went up here. I did it. Can anybody see where I put this lid? Huh? There it is. It fell inside. All right. It was nice and tight before. Here's what can happen. Depending on how seasoned your wood is, it can be tighter or it can be looser. Generally, now that I've run this this, if you use a forstner bit, I can tell you it's going to be tighter. And the reason it's going to be tighter is because the forstner bit gets the wood really hot. But generally, you've heated this wood up, and it's swelled up a little bit, and it's going to be tight, okay, tighter than it was before. That means if I go to fit this top perfectly right now, when it cools back down, it's going to be too loose. So if you are making your first box or two, now's a good time to go in the house and have a glass of iced tea or whatever you want to do and let the wood actually cool down again. If I feel this wood, I can tell you that it's warm. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna take a shot at it, because I like to gamble. Good thing to the man that I'd win. But. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this, this, this tenon right here down just a little bit smaller and get this lid to fit just a little bit better. And hopefully, it, uh, I won't get it so small that it's sloppy. But I do know that it's got to come down some. That's still just a little bit tight. We're going to try it just a little bit later. That last cut that Rudy Lopez talks about. One more cut. All right. If you turn 500 to 1,000 boxes, and I'm guessing that's what I've turned because I actually quit counting. I used to serial number them, and I quit at 300, and that was five years ago. So I know I've made over 500. My wife says I've made 1,000. I don't believe that. I think she's just irritated because she has to dust them and move them around in the house. But uh, if you've made enough of them, regardless, every now and then you get one right. All right, now we're going to come back to our line. We're going to park this thing off. We're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to leave them. We're going to leave plenty of room in here. I'm taking this parting tool and I'm making a cut. I'm coming back out and I'm going half the width of this parting tool. It's an eighth of an inch. That means I'm going a sixteenth of an inch. That means my part is actually three thirty seconds of an inch wide so that this tool doesn't bind up. I can go into the, the base of the box a little bit. I know that I'm that thick. And in the end, I want a little bit of a concave in the bottom of the box anyway because it'll fit better. We'll stop right there for just a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I am. That's one reason I'm stopping right now. I'm going to finish the inside because you can't come back to it. <coughs> Don Geiger told me, never turn wood you don't like to taste. When I was first learning to turn, and I don't know, it was 11 or 12 years ago, Don Geiger came by, the, I don't know if you guys know Don, he, he lives about three or four miles from me. He came by the shop where I was learning to turn at, and uh, I was turning a piece and he looked at it and he backed away. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye backing away because he knew that piece was going to come off. Well, it didn't come off, so, and I always made fun of him for it afterwards. I said, yeah, I saw you there when I was turning that piece. So I was doing a platter demonstration the other day. And Don was in the back of the room, and he went and hid behind my wife. 
She's back there. She'll tell you, yes, they did. He didn't like the way I was holding the plow. Not everybody agrees with the way you turn things. I didn't hold that against him, and I probably shouldn't have mentioned it. I love Don. Don's been a lot of help to me. Uh, he sells some super products. I live around, right around the corner from, well, I'll say right around, about four miles from him. And uh, every now and then I'll come out and see that he's left me something to try, one of his new tools or something, to try it and see what I think. This is one of those safety things. This is a paper rag. I would never stick a cloth in here, ever. Because this piece of paper towel, if it catches, it'll just rip. If you stick a piece of cloth in there, it, uh, it won't rip. And sometimes safety goes beyond what you think it, it is. In the summertime, I, I turn outside and I turn in shorts. And I was out turning one day in some flip-flops. And I was turning something that wasn't round. And I didn't notice this elm round sitting on the shelf that bounced off and landed on my right toe. And it didn't break it, but I spent several nights sleeping with my foot out from under the covers. Luckily, I sleep on the right side of the bed, so that worked out. I got a little nubbin I'm going to leave in there. All right, one quick little spray here on the outside. Uh, clear. This is a, just another product from Chroma Craft. It's a, it's a lacquer, and it's a really, really good lacquer. It's like automotive quality lacquer or even better. And uh, it doesn't yellow. It goes on really nice. You guys ready to catch a little slacker if I turn this up? I'm sorry? Uh, sanding sealer, lacquer sanding sealer. I mean, I could have sprayed it in there, but that'll fill in everything I needed to fill in. And it's cheap. You know, a quarter of it's like eight bucks or something. Some of this stuff is not cheap. Like a can of this spray lacquer here is like $11. But it's really, really good. It's got a lot of heavy body to it. You don't end up putting 15 coats on something to polish it. You can put six on it instead. So if you go buy the cheap stuff at the hardware store and you end up putting 15 coats on, you really didn't save any money. All right. We'll see what the color will say for save the chuck here. That's just shrink wrap I put on there. I found it's real handy to put on things like chucks so that you don't. I don't do it to my own. I don't care if I paint it. I'll clean it off later if it needs to. But I don't want to be respectful of other people's equipment. Hang on to it right here. Let's finish part of this off. Whenever you start back doing this, don't do like I did before. Take your time, get it aimed right, and get it in there. We're going to do the same thing we did before.
I'm gonna make a jam chuck here to put this on. Almost a little, almost missed it. You know, that's the way you're supposed to make like two shots and you got it, but it doesn't always work out that way. All right, once again, we can, we can make really, really light cuts. We can tape that if we want to, which is a good idea because once it comes loose, it's loose. If you tape it, you got a better shot at it not tearing up. Sometimes, though, if you put this tape over this fresh lacquer, it leaves a little line. All right. Let's finish off the bottom, put a little sanding sealer on it, we'll call it done. I get a few, few of the little light tool marks out. Right on the edge where we started our part, my parting tool. And that's probably good enough. All right. Let's try it one more time, see if we can hit three of them. This is just a little pointy tool. Don't know who makes it. Don't know where I got it. It's a little three-sided triangle thing. I think Cindy Drozda has one, but this is not one of hers.
I don't necessarily advocate that you put this on with your finger either. I think, I think from what I understand from the last thing I've read is pretty much anything that cures and stays on the bowl after a while is food grade. Your things like it's on your car, if it doesn't, if it, if it stays on the wood, it's perfectly safe. It turns to plastic. And uh, I don't think there's anything in lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner is a, uh, is mostly acetone. So most all of the thinners that are in this come completely back out of it. And all you're left with is the base material. So uh, I would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about eating off of it. So now whether or not other people would agree with that, I don't know. Coming around. That's it. You guys have questions? Let hey, me, uh, Jack, let me, we have a question down here, Jack. Uh, let me put one oh, other thing up here first. Okay. Uh, I forgot to bring any business cards. If you guys do have questions, the best thing you can do is either email me or text me. Okay, text probably works the best. Let me give you a phone number. If you call me at this number, I will not answer because the phone won't ring. Zero, five, zero, four. That's the number you can send me a text. If, if your question is involved, give me a, I'll call you back on the phone to answer it. Uh, if your question is simple, I'll answer it. I'll be glad to return your text. Uh, if you want to email me, it's really easy. It's Jack Roberts FL, FL is in Florida, at gmail.com. So I'll answer it that way too. And I'm sorry I didn't bring any cards. And somebody had a question. Yes, sir. The, the easiest thing to do with a threaded box that the grain doesn't match up is to take a little bit off the top until you get it to match up. Uh, the worst case scenario is you're 170 degrees off and at a 16th. If you're using, hang on guys, he's got a question. If you're using a 16 uh, point threader, you know, which is the most popular, that means that you're only talking about taking at the most a 16th of an inch off to go all the way around. So 50% of the time, you'll only be taking a 32nd of an inch off. You can usually do it with a piece of sandpaper. My suggestion is if you got a piece of PSA paper, you know what I'm talking about? Pressure sensitive paper, it's got the sticky on it. Stick it on your bandsaw, because that's flat, take the lid like this, set it down and go, and then try it a couple of times until it, until it matches up. Once again, remember, you're taking it off, and if you miss it, you miss it. You can tighten it back up. If you need to come back just a little bit, you can tighten it back up by putting some lacquer around the edge of it to build the, build the base back up a little bit or nail polish or whatever you're using for a finish. Just put some heavy finish in. That'll help you back it up. If you, but you're only gonna back it up at the most a quarter turn and I would say not even that. That help you? Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, dust be gone. Well, she'll answer, but you can see it at dust be gone. Uh, Isn't it B-E-E? -E? Is it B-E-E? -E? Yeah. Very comfortable mask. Woodcraft officer pays, has them. You'll just pay a little bit more money if you order it through Woodcraft. I think Packard carries them too. So, yes sir. You know, I started painting cars in the late 60s and I owned my own paint shop. I painted Corvettes all the way through 70s, and all we painted was lacquer. I don't know what pre-catalyzed lacquer is. I'm sorry. Lacquer, <laughs> lacquer by its nature, when you spray another coat on, it dissolves into the bottom coat. And that's different than urethanes or polyurethanes or anything else. If a polyurethane is cured and you put another polyurethane on top of it, it doesn't, you have to scuff it. You get two kinds of adhesion between, between finishes. You get either mechanical adhesion because it's attached to the scratches that you put in it, when you sand something, or you get a chemical bond adhesion where it melts into it. 
So I think that when they talk about pre-catalyzed lacquer, nobody's ever been able to tell me exactly what. I think what they've done is put an agent in it where, the, where it doesn't actually melt back into itself. It catalyzes completely, and, and four days later, it can put another coat on it, but I, I don't know for certain, so I can't be sure. So I've, I've used it before. I don't find it superior. Mohawk's the only company I know that makes it, and I, I haven't found it superior to anything else. So I generally buy the cheapest thing I can find that does the job I want to do it and does it well. Now, this stuff's not cheap, but it goes a long way. So. Other questions? Thanks again, Gentlemen Jack. and ladies, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. <laughs> you got a great facility. It was wonderful. And th thank you and Stephanie for making the trip down here for a great demo, Jack. Um, we're all going to go home and unfuzz all our work, right? <laughs> you got to learn one new word every at every demo. Uh, Tom has uh, a couple of drawings to do, so don't go away. You might be a winner. Yeah, you're a good instructor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.